I've never been so excited to film a secrets video. Hey, Mayo fam, I am coming to you from my favorite Disney park, the OG, the one that started it all. Disneyland. And we are going to do a secrets video at Disneyland. This is the video series where I share all the secrets, the details, the backstories, the imaginary genius that makes these parks so special. I have never been so excited to make a secrets video. These are some of my favorite videos to share. I'm in the OG park, the one that Walt Disney built and came to, and there is so much goodness to share. We just got to get into it. We're going to have a great day. We're going to have some snacks, ride some rides, get ready for all kinds of trivia and fun. Like, let's just go. Now to kick this video off, we're gonna have a little story time. And it's the story of the Disneyland opening because it did not go well. You see, Walt Disney had this idea that there should be a place that kids of all ages can go with their families and have a little family fun. He came up with this idea of taking his kids to Griffith Park, watching them go on the merry-go-round while he sat on a bench and fed some ducks and thought, this isn't that much fun for me, but it's fun for them. I wish there was somewhere we could all go and have fun together. Remember that, because we're gonna see something else to do with that particular moment in the tale in just a little bit. So Walt thought of this idea for Disneyland. He's a filmmaker. He thought, why don't I make a film that people can go to? And he had all these things that he remembered growing up at county fairs. He loved trains, he loved boat rides, he loved just being immersed in an environment, and he thought, I'm gonna build Disneyland. Everyone told him this is crazy. They said, Amusement parks are gross, they're dirty. The people that work there are unsavory. No one's gonna wanna go, why would you wanna build this? And Walt said, my park won't be like that. But of course, to build something like Disneyland, you need some cash money. So he decided, because he was very smart, he and Roy, his brother, who's the financial genius behind the company, he and his brother Roy decided they were gonna use TV as a way to advertise and fund the Disneyland project. You see, at the time, TV was struggling a little bit, so he decided he was gonna pitch to ABC Network a Disneyland show where Walt could talk you through all his ideas, share with you all the dreams they had, and in return, that would fund Disneyland. But in order for the pitch, they had to have something to show the executives. So Walt went to one of his artists named Herb Ryman. So many of Walt's original Imagineers were actually animators at his studio, and he went to a gentleman named Herb Ryman, who was an incredible artist, but he often waited to the last minute. And he said, Herb, I need you to draw Disneyland. And Herb's like, great, what is Disneyland? And he explained it, he said, there's gonna be a beautiful castle and there's gonna be a train station, and there's gonna be rides and characters and it's gonna be amazing. And Herb's like, perfect. Then Herb kept um, procrastinating and it wasn't until they had one weekend left before the Disneyland pitch and Walt's like, Herb, I need you to draw this. So for one weekend, Herb didn't leave the studio and he poured for hours and hours over pages and pages and he drew the most incredible drawings of the castle, of the lands, of the train station. And it is that artwork that they took to their pitch with ABC and the bank and they pitched Disneyland and ABC bought in for $5 million. They now had one year to build Disneyland, one year. I want you to think about how long it's taken Tron to come true. They had one year to build this entire park, so they got to work. And as you might guess, they went out of budget. Not just a little bit out of budget, they went over triple that $5 million budget from ABC. They ended up spending $17 million to build Disneyland. And part of that was Walt Disney's life insurance policy that he cashed out to self-fund the project. He believed in it that much. So now's the part in the story where I tell you about Disneyland's opening. And it was wonderful and magical and all of Walt's dreams came true and it was perfect and everyone thought, this is such a success, you did it, Walt. Except that's literally the opposite of what happened. Disneyland and Disney history nerds refer to the opening of Day of Disneyland as Black Sunday. Basically, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Many of the attractions weren't used to the weight of so many guests and the wear and tear of so many guests riding them, having only been tested a few times with the Imagineers, so many of the attractions broke. There were so many people on the riverboat that it started sinking. <laughs> because of the budget, and because they were just kind of self-funding it as they went week by week, they weren't able to lay the concrete until just a few nights before Disneyland opened, and it was unseasonably hot, so it never actually dried. So ladies in the 50s, dressing up all nice for the opening day of Disneyland, are wearing high heels, and they are literally sinking, leaving heel indents down Main Street USA because the concrete wasn't set. 
Because this was all farmland, farmers realized they could make an extra buck, so they propped up ladders on the backside of Disneyland and were charging people a couple bucks to use their ladder to jump into the back of Disneyland. Not only that, somebody took their exclusive ticket invite to Disneyland and put it in the local paper, so there were thousands of counterfeit copies of a Disneyland ticket. So then more than 10 times the amount of people that they expected to show up for the opening showed up for the opening. And what happens when that many people show up? You run out of things like food. You run out of things like drinks. My personal favorite thing that went wrong with the opening of Disneyland, though, is that at the time there was a union strike, a plumber's union strike. So they did not have enough time to finish both the water fountains and the toilets. They came to Walt and Roy a few weeks before the event and they said, listen, we're not going to be able to get both of these things done. Which one do you think takes priority? And they're like, water fountains, obviously. No, they obviously went with toilets, but that means they didn't have any running water fountains. So people were forced to buy things like sodas from the concession stands, and then the Disney company was accused of price gouging and just trying to make a cheap buck because they didn't offer free water fountains to their guests. The traffic to get into Disneyland was miles and miles and hours and hours long to the point where people were peeing in the parking lot and they came to Roy Disney and they're like, kids are peeing in the parking lot, there's not enough porta potties. And Roy said, let them pee. But you know who didn't know any of this was going wrong? The millions and millions of people that tuned into ABC to watch the grand opening of Disneyland. They watched Walt Disney and a slew of Hollywood stars, including a young Ronald Reagan, introduce you to the park and show you around at this wondrous and magical land. And people bought it. And it was just two months later that Disneyland welcomed its one million guests. Of course, they fixed everything that was going wrong. They fixed any of the attractions that were having issues. They got water fountains installed and Disneyland became a smash success. And the rest, as they say, is history. But I just love that story because quite literally everything went wrong. People told Walt this was a terrible idea and he didn't listen. He believed in this idea and now it's this most wonderful, happiest place on earth that all of us get to enjoy. Now I could probably do an entire video just on Main Street with all the details there are in this land, but we're gonna mix it up. We're gonna go around the entire park and share a few details in each land. Gotta save something for the part two, am I right? But I think it's important that the very first thing I point out right here above the fire station is Walt's apartment. Walt was spending so much time at the park that they went ahead and built him a little apartment over the fire station that he and his wife Lillian and his daughters could stay at when they were coming to the parks. And you may notice that whenever you come to Disneyland, there's a lantern right here in the window and it's always on. That is a nod to Walt and the fact that he is always here overlooking his park and the guests enjoying the happiest place on earth. Scooting right along over to Disneyland City Hall. This is of course where you can find your guest relations cast members. A couple fun things I like to point out. First of all, right here, You've got this lost parent sign. Anyone recognize the parents on it? That's Mr. and Mrs. Darling from Peter Pan because their children become lost boys. Get it? Hilarious. Poor Nana. Poor Nana? Poor father! I had to. I'm actually kind of having a moment right now because I didn't realize this was in here. I came in to show you another Easter egg and this is the concept art, like the actual concept art by Herb Ryman that I was just talking about. It's right here. I didn't know this was here. What I came into City Hall to show you was the bookshelf. If you come and look, there's all kinds of different books that are nods to, of course, Disney stories. You've got Pollyanna, The Real Little Mermaid, Lambish the Sheepest Lion. You even got things like The Lily, Ball, the Lily Bell by W.E. Disney. That would be Walter Elias Disney. That is a nod to his wife, Lily. And I love that the authors are all characters from the movie. So like Sleep Media is written by Flora Fauna and Meriwether. Jungle Book was written by Man Cub. But the one I wanted to highlight especially is the Walt and You book. It was written by Sigis and Kimbrell. That is a nod to a cast member that worked as a custodial cast member, Ray Sigis, and then Bruce Kimball. They worked together to write a book called Walt Disney and You, and it's a training manual now used by cast members to kind of learn the foundational ideals of the Disney company. Remember when I told you to put a pin into the part of the story where Walt had a bench that he sat on? Well, it's right here. This is the bench that Walt sat on in Griffith Park at the merry-go-round, and this is one of the carousel horses. This is the bench where he thought of Disneyland. Also, it looks like I'm crying, but I'm not right now. My eyes get really watery in Disneyland. I don't know why, but this one eye like leaks all day in Disneyland, which is kind of fitting, but that's pretty cool. You can spot the bench in the lobby of Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, which was one of the attractions that Disney Company did for the 64 to 65 New York's World's Fair. Abraham Lincoln was Walt Disney's favorite president, and he actually had the dream of doing the Hall of Presidents, um, which inspired Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. They didn't have the technology at the time to do all of the presidents, but they did figure out the technology to do Lincoln. A few fun things about the Lincoln animatronic is that when it debuted, it was so realistic that people used to throw pennies 
ironically, at the animatronic figure because they were convinced it was a real person and they figured if they threw a penny at it and it was a real person, they would flinch. Additionally, in one of the first showings of Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, when they were showing it to a few preview audiences, something happened and one of the valves, tubes inside of Lincoln broke and it started leaking hydraulic oil and fluid. At the time, that was red. So it looked like Lincoln had been shot <laughs> too soon. Um, so that is actually what prompted the Disney company to switch to clear hydraulic oil and fluid. Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln isn't a must-do for most people, I feel like, but it's pretty cool to see this piece of Disney history. Um, I know certain generation really enjoys it, but for me, it's just amazing to see how realistic that animatronic is and think about how this first human audio animatronic led to so many attractions that we know and love today. Abraham Lincoln walked, so Honda Onaka and the Shaman of Song could run and fly. Hopping into the Magic Shop, this is one of my little favorite stores in Disneyland. It's such a Disneyland thing. Steve Martin actually worked here. There's a couple of fun details to look for. One, if you look up on the ceiling, there's a hidden Mickey in the Ace. You'll notice that the Ace of Clubs is actually a Mickey in the middle. Another cool one is that all along Main Street, you can find these old-timey phones, and if you actually pick them up and listen, you can hear conversations. And they were playing Lion King, which is my favorite movie. Oh my gosh, this is the best. We're headed into the Emporium now, the classic shop with the majority of items you want to purchase. You can find them in the Emporium. Apparel, ears, cups, mugs, toys, you can find it in here. And I'm so excited for this very particular Easter egg. We got to find the train here in the toy room of the Emporium. There's a toy train that rides around. And it looks like Captain Hook, Mr. Smee, Peter Pan are on the train. And then if you look up, you've also got some favorite characters, Mary Poppins and Bert with some penguins, Snow White and the Prince, Robin Hood, characters from the Jungle Book, Toy Story Buzz is up there, Jimmy Cricket. Um, but this is maybe the coolest Hidden Mickey ever. If you notice, the train is going around and just like the train in real life, it needs to stop and get some water. So take a look at the water fill station right over here. In real life, trains need water to make steam. That's how steam engines work. So there are refill stations along both the Walt Disney World and the Disneyland Railroad. In Walt Disney World, it's over at the Storybook Circus station. And in Disneyland, it's at the New Orleans Square station. But here in the Emporium, you've got your water tower right there. And on every third loop around, the train makes a stop. It fills up when well, you can know it's filling up because a hidden Mickey lights up. And then the train gives us its little two beep whistle, which is let's go. And then it's off again. Is this not the coolest hidden Mickey ever? Many Disney fans know that all of the windows and names on Main Street are nods to people that were important to the Disney company. I can do a whole video just on windows at some point, but this is one of my favorite ones here. We have the two brothers, two makers, Richard and Robert Sherman, the proprietors. And then on the piano here, they've got the It's a Small World music and we'll write your tunes for a song. Richard and Robert Sherman, I've talked about them a lot in these Disney secrets and history videos. They are the amazing song making duo behind songs like It's a Small World, Enchanted Tiki Room, All of Mary Poppins, Jungle Book, uh, One Little Spark. So of course they get a nod on Main Street. Many people know that Main Street USA is loosely designed after Walt Disney's boyhood home of Marceline, Missouri. So the happiest memories of his life were in Marceline. He moved there around the time he was five. So when they designed Main Street USA, it's designed to be kind of any town in America around the turn of the century, which is why you've got this 1900s kind of Victorian style decor. Listen up while you're on Market Street and you could hear different residents doing things. For example, at the Hotel Marceline, you might hear a gentleman taking a shower and trying to adjust to the right water temperature. Here you've got piano lessons. You may hear somebody learning how to play some music. And here at the Painless Dental School, you may hear that that's possibly false advertising. And then in keeping with our Black Sunday Disneyland disaster story, you might notice that by this water fountain near the lockers that the bricks are all messed up. The story is that this is where they were testing different kinds of bricks and foundation and, um, you know, those didn't work, but they left them here. So just kind of a fun little goof, you know? Also, if you come into the Starbucks, you've got more of these phones and it says, listen on in, let's eavesdrop, let's find out what kind of tea we can get. She's chatty. I was learning some hot gossip about some of the neighborhood folks, but moral of the story, if you see an old phone, pick it up. Moving right along, we're headed to the Penny Arcade here to go see a friend of mine, Esmeralda. 
But real quick, if you look at the penny on top of the Penny Arcade, it's dated 1901. That's because Walt Disney was born in 1901. December 5th, in fact, one day before my birthday. Except I wasn't born in 1901. Obviously. Now it's one of those like silly Disneyland things that they have these boxes everywhere. They've got some on Main Street, they've got some in New Orleans Square, and they're like fortune tellers or pirates and they, you can give them a couple quarters and they will give you a fortune. Unfortunately, Esmeralda isn't working today, but one thing that's not out of order is that wing. Girl, sharp enough to kill a man. Another Disney legend is that not only do they control the color palette, the music, everything that you hear, but they also control what you smell when you are setting the scene coming down Main Street USA. You are coming down by the Candy Palace. You are coming down by the ice cream cones. And don't you think you should be able to smell those things? Well, you can. They actually installed what they call smellitizers. Look at that vent right there. And they're actually able to push out the different smells that they want you to smell, both real and artificial. So that way, when you walk by the Candy Palace, you smell the candy and the treats being made. When you walk by the ice cream parlor, you can smell those waffle cones being made because they want to fully immerse you in your surroundings. And smell's a big part of that. Quick pop into a refreshment corner, a place I would never Never eat because it's hot dogs, but I do have a cool thing to show you. Here at the entrance of Refreshment Corner, you will see they're using these fun red and white light bulbs, but unfortunately they had an odd number of them. Take a look at that one in the corner. You'll notice it's cleverly split in half between red and white, so that way if you're just looking at this, your eye doesn't realize there's a mess up and it continues on with the pattern. I'm telling you, the attention to detail in these places is bonkers. Also, look how pretty the horse is. I just love being here. It feels like I'm back in time. Moving right along off Main Street USA into Adventureland. Very excited, but we got to pause before we can get in the land so I can tell one of my favorite Disney history stories, and it's about the Enchanted Tiki Room. Walt Disney acquired a little crude mechanical bird at a flea market in New Orleans. And he was kind of tinkering with it, and he was like, this is interesting. So he gave it to some of his Imagineers, primarily Waithel Rogers, and he said, what can you do with this? So the Imagineers came up with the idea for a dinner show where you'd go in and it would be all tiki and tropical themed and you would have all these birds and flowers singing above you as they were the performers come to life during the show. This, as you may know, is the beginning of audio animatronics. One of the most famous inventions of the Disney company, a staple of attractions worldwide. The very first animatronics were made for the Tiki Room. Now they eventually scrapped the dinner show idea because one, Walt was like, they'll poop on you get it it's a hilarious joke birds you're under your food you get it um, but two they'd realize that if people were eating they wouldn't pay attention to the show going on around them so the Imagineers again primarily Waithel Rogers he was like the godfather of audio animatronics tinkered with and figured out how to make these incredible robotic creatures that would come to life before your eyes and so they made hundreds and hundreds of these birds and these flowers and Walt Disney came in and he watched the show and he said why aren't they breathing and they were like, they're not real, Walt. And he's like, I understand they're not real, but if you are going to convince the audience that they're real, they need to breathe. Their chests need to move in and out. They have to be real. They need to breathe. This task fell on the Imagineers, particularly one of my favorite Imagineers, Harriet Burns, one of the original three Imagineers, a female Imagineer, went to work every day in a dress and tights and heels, but boy, could she climb a ladder and hang out with the men. Anyway, Harriet Burns was tasked with figuring out how to cover the breastplate of the birds, which now moved up and down, and make it look realistic, because the feathers they were using were crinkling and wrinkling, and they did not look realistic. But one day in a meeting, she watched Walt, and he was wearing a cashmere sweater, and he's talking and smoking, and he's doing this with his hands, and she realized that the cashmere, looking at his elbow, moved and went back to where it was with Walt. So she came up with the idea of getting cashmere, dyeing it to match the bird's feathers, and putting it on the chest of the birds. That way, as their chest plates breathed in and out, the fabric went, moved, and shrunk with them. So because of Harriet Burns, because of Waitha Rogers, because of the Enchanted Tiki Room, we now have incredible audio animatronics like the Shaman of Song, like Hondo Onaka, like the droids in Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, like the Stuntronic in California Adventure. All of that started because of the Enchanted Tiki Room and the realness of them started because Walt Disney had four words and one simple question, why aren't they breathing?
Nowadays, seeing the Enchanted Tiki Room is a Disneyland history rite of passage. They even built the Tiki Juice Bar right here just for Tiki Room viewers to be able to get themselves a pineapple dole and go enjoy the show. We did that on the last time we were at Disneyland. It is such a fun Disney history moment. And again, we have a lot to thank for the Tiki Room. Adventureland is home to some iconic attractions in this park, Jungle Cruise being one of them, Indiana Jones Adventure being another. Unfortunately, Indiana Jones Adventure is closed for refurbishment right now because I got a lot of good secrets about that one. We'll keep it for the part two. Uh, but first, before we get into anything Jungle Cruise, I like showing you off this mosaic. Eagle-eyed Aladdin fans will immediately notice that this is carpet from Aladdin. And that's because before this was the tropical hideaway, the place to get the vast majority of your Dole Whips here in Disneyland, they got a variety of flavors. This was called Aladdin's Oasis. It was a show for several years, and then it was a meet and greet with Aladdin and Aladdin themed characters before it was transformed in 2018 to the tropical hideaway. But I love that they left this beautiful tile work because not only is it a fun nod to something of the past, but it's pretty beautiful and an Easter egg of one of your favorite Aladdin characters, or at least mine. I really like Carpet. I feel like he doesn't get enough credit. Now let's talk about the Jungle Cruise. I went into the history of the Jungle Cruise and the Magic Kingdom version of this video, but the condensed version is that Walt wanted to bring real life African animals to Disneyland so that people who haven't been able to travel all around the world could do so right here in California. The problem was real life safari animals are incredibly expensive. They are nocturnal and they didn't have a lot of space. So they ended up doing mechanical animals that you see on the Jungle Cruise. And yes, I say mechanical, not audio animatronics because this is an opening day attraction both here and in Walt Disney World, and as we just learned, audio animatronics weren't invented yet. They weren't invented until the Tiki Room opened up in 1963. They have since added audio animatronics to the Jungle Cruise. Those new scenes have audio animatronics, but all the originals are just mechanical figures. They eventually did get to realize Walt Disney's dream of having real life animals for people to look at over at Kilimanjaro Safaris in Disney's Animal Kingdom. And it still boggles my mind that something that opened in 1998 was Walt Disney's idea in the 50s. But today, talking about the Jungle Cruise, I want to focus on one man, Morgan Bill Evans. He was the horticulture expert for the parks. He's the one who was in charge of landscaping these beautiful places. The problem was when Disneyland opened, he didn't have a real big budget. We've already talked about the fact that Disneyland had to be built in a year and that they went three times over the budget. So he was tasked with trying to create a tropical jungle oasis here in Southern California. And he did two things that just kind of make me laugh because they're pretty ingenious. The first is he took orange trees, which are in abundance in Southern California that they were clearing out to make room for Disneyland. And he planted them along the Jungle Cruise in two different fashions. One, he kind of used them as like the bulk filler plant. Like if you've ever made a vase of flowers, maybe you might add in some baby's breath or some ferns or some greenery to just bulk it up and make it look denser. But then you've got your like star of the show flowers in there as well. Consider the orange trees, like the filler flowers or the baby's breath of the Jungle Cruise. But that did mean that cast members then had to go and pluck the oranges off every day because oranges wouldn't be growing on the trees in the jungle. Second thing he did with the orange trees is flip them upside down so that their roots were in the air because they looked more exotic that way. The other thing Bill Evans did that I think is hilarious is he put ads in local papers saying if you have a tree in your yard that you'd like to clear it out, the Disney company will come get rid of it for you for free. So he drove around to people's houses that wanted to get rid of a tree or a bush. They didn't want to use it anymore. And he collected them like Craigslist before there was Craigslist for flowers and plants that eventually became the Jungle Cruise here in Disneyland. Oh, and one more thing about the Jungle Cruise. If you've ever wondered about the jungle water and if it's that weird brown greenish color, if that could affect you in any way, it's actually dyed that way. It's perfectly clean water, but the way that they dye the water is they add the dye in at the top of Schweitzer Falls, you know, the famous waterfall named after Dr. Albert Falls, and it acts as a big mixer to mix the dye throughout the water cast members have said it looks like the chocolate waterfall in Willy Wonka. I love that the windows don't end on Main Street. If you look above the fruit market here, you can see tattooing by Professor Harper Goff. Harper Goff was one of Walt Disney's set designers on movies like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and he used them a lot to build Disneyland because what is Disneyland if not just a giant movie set? So he used his knowledge and technical know-how of creating things like the squid in 20,000 Leagues to bring some of the original sets and uh, big pieces to Disneyland taking a little snack break to eat one of my favorite Disneyland foods, meat sticks. These are the skewers from Bengal Barbecue in Adventureland across from Indiana Jones, and they serve like chicken and pork and beef and a variety of skewers with different sauces. This is the Bane and Beef, it's the spicy beef one. It is one of my favorite Disney foods. But another thing to point out when you go to Bengal Barbecue is that in the tree inside that the um, grill is made up of, you're going to want to look at some monkeys because they're making a certain pose. They're doing a little hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, which is very cute. Mm. They're just so 
good. First of all, always get the extra sauce. The banyan sauce is spicy, and I mean actually spicy, not just theme park spicy. But this meat is always so juicy and flavorful, and it's like simplicity and deliciousness, and I don't understand why Disney World doesn't have meat sticks. One of my favorite Disney foods. Also, mobile order, because the line gets really long. Welcome, friends, to New Orleans Square. This is my favorite land in Disneyland, behind Fantasyland. It's so full of life, and it is Mardi Gras 365. This is also where you're going to find some of those popular Disney attractions. Haunted Mansion and Pirates of the Caribbean are here in Disneyland versus Adventureland and Liberty Square in Magic Kingdom. There's actually no Liberty Square here. But as you can imagine, a land with two of the most popular attractions and themed after one of the most exciting places in the world is going to have a ton of detail, including one of my favorites. You can see it from right here. If you look up here, there's a second story balcony there. That is part of the Dream Suite. Now, originally that space was chosen by Walt Disney to be a place that he could entertain some high roller guests, and it was called the Royal Suite. He actually had gone with the wind set designer, Dorothea Redman, designed the aesthetic and the look of the suite. Dorothea Redman ended up becoming an Imagineer. It is now the Dream Suite, which is something that you can win access to. It's also home to 21 Royal, which is an incredibly expensive dinner party that you can book. I'm talking 15 to $20,000 for the meal expensive. But if you look out on that balcony, you'll notice that gold iron work. It used to actually blend in with the blue, but they decided to paint it gold to make it stand out more. Those are a WD and an RD, which are a nod to Walt Disney and Roy Disney, the Disney Brothers. It is also with greatest sorrow, as I tell you about an Easter egg, I can't show you right now, but we can see kind of part of why I can't show you. You can see right here, you've got the uh, Disneyland Treehouse, which they're revamping. It was Swiss Family Robinson, then it was Tarzan. They're revamping it right now, reimagining it. But there's another cool Easter egg back over by the Treehouse and by Indiana Jones. And it is the little man that lived at Disneyland. In a tree by the Swiss Family Treehouse and Indiana Jones, there is the door to the home of Patrick Bagora, the leprechaun, who was in a little golden book that was sold in 1955. It's become recirculated. Um, I actually bought it for my nephews recently, but it's a cute little story about the little man who lived at Disneyland. He's a little leprechaun. Fortunately, you can't see it right now, but when the construction changes, I'll make sure to show it in a future Disneyland video. Here we have the entrance of Pirates of the Caribbean. Obviously, it looks a lot different than the one in Walt Disney World, which looks like a pirate fortress. Here, you've got this New Orleans-style southern manor home that you're going to enter in for Pirates of the Caribbean. Now, Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland is my favorite Disney attraction that I've ever been on anywhere. A lot of that is for nostalgia reasons, because I have a lot of nostalgic memories riding the one in Magic Kingdom, but it's also because I consider this to be a pretty perfect Disney attraction. And according to Marty Sklar, who's an Imagineering legend, he was the VP of Imagineering for a long time, they compared everything they did after Pirates of the Caribbean to Pirates of the Caribbean. This was the golden standard as far as an attraction goes. It is a boat ride, but it's family friendly. Everybody can enjoy it. A boat is a classic Disney mode of transportation. You have these incredible pirate animatronics. They've plussed it up and brought it back full circle by adding in new animatronics from the films. It's funny. It's got original music. It is just a quintessential Disney attraction. And it was also the last attraction that Walt Disney himself personally had a hand in supervising. Walt Disney passed away in 1966. Pirates of the Caribbean opened here in Disneyland in 1967. And I talked a lot about Pirates of the Caribbean in the Magic Kingdom version, telling some stories about like Mark Davis, who's one of my favorite Imagineers. He's the one who made it funny. Um, but today I want to talk about Ex Atencio. So Ex Atencio was another animator, as most of Walt Disney's original Imagineers were, but he had a real way with words. He was a wordsmith. He could always, the way he phrased things was very, very interesting. So he is who Disney hired to be the script writer for Pirates of the Caribbean. And at first, Exitensio thought he wrote too many words because you went on the test ride of the attraction, you couldn't hear everything that the pirates were saying. He wrote too many things based on the timing of the attraction and he thought Walt was going to be mad. But Walt Disney said, no, that is excellent. It's like a cocktail party. If you were to walk around a cocktail party, you'd hear snippets of this conversation and that conversation, you wouldn't get the whole picture, which will make us want to write again and again because they're going to hear different snippets based on the timing of their boat, based on what they're paying attention to. It's going to be a new experience every time you go as you are fully immersed into this pirate scenario. Scenario. Additionally, Exitensio is who wrote the lyrics to Yo Ho Yo Ho, A Pirate's Life for Me, and eventually he became the scriptwriter over at Haunted Mansion and wrote the lyrics to Grand Guinea Ghost. It's just amazing to me that this person was an animator. They had no history of writing, they had no experience writing. Walt Disney had this incredible ability to peg people for something he thought they'd be good at and make them do a job that they probably weren't ready to do, and then they would do an excellent job of it. One last detail before we avast on Pirates of the Caribbean. Make sure to look for the headboard in the pirate cave. There is a skull attached to one of the headboard, and legend has it that that's a real human skull. But avast, mateys, it's time to set sail and plunder the seas. I will stop doing a pirate accent eventually, but today is not the day.
This is the pirate themed gift shop in the land. For starters, you may notice this monkey chandelier right here. It's being like a silly monkey. Legend has it, this is what inspired the monkey in Pirates of the Caribbean, the movie. This is maybe my favorite detail in the land thus far. If you look in this window at Pieces of Eight, you'll see all kinds of piratey thing, gold and treasure and goblets. But you might also notice that there's a voodoo doll of Captain Jack, the way his face is painted in the second Pirates of the Caribbean. So somebody's got it out for him. Or probably a lot of someone's the way he behaves. I often say in these videos that if you want to notice good detail, look up. And if you look up right here, you will notice a flag waving in the breeze atop New Orleans Square. That's the Louisiana State flag with the pelican on it. We're in New Orleans after all. I'm sorry, should I say we're in New Orleans? I've never been to New Orleans. Would I survive New Orleans? I should go just to eat a lot of beignets. Hello, Captain Jack. How are you? Much better now. Music. You yeah. like music? I do like music. Dancing. I do like dancing. Yes. You what are you doing? I, I'm recording a memo to send to my friends. My crew. Where are you? They're far away. They're sailing the seas looking for treasure. What are the names? Um, Max and Alan. That's who? Yeah. Assume, it's a small crew. Small crew. <laughs> Max and who? Alan. Max and Alan, all my love, miss me right now. Thank really you. Yeah. I'll do without you. Do you want to join our crew? We can join mine. Okay, perfect. How, how should I pose? How do you pose all like right. a pirate? Okay. Here's the secret. Okay. You think about treasure. Okay. And then you think about Jack Sparrow trying to steal your treasure. So you have just a little bit of attitude. Okay. What yes. is your name here? Molly. Molly, what a great pirate. Thank Need to go you. up here, Thank pirate you. Molly. Yes. Thank okay, you. are you a bit of royalty? Judging yes. by your beautiful headdress. I'm trying to be a royal pirate. <laughs> Captain Red is at your service, Thank you. Captain and I hope that if you're looking to join the crew, you join my crew. Okay. I just met Pirate Red and Captain Jack. I love Disneyland. They're just like roaming about. It's so fun. This next one is another one that I'm just like, the detail is unreal and probably no one notices it. So it's clearly a labor of love. But if you look down New Orleans Square, you can see the Mardi Gras mask, you can see the shops and restaurants. But if you keep looking, you can actually see the mast of a pirate ship. And you have to be way far away to see it. You have to be way back, almost in Frontierland or possibly on Tom Sawyer Island. Can't see it any other place, but all it does is cue you that you are heading into a land of mystery and adventure and plundering pirates. And again, I ask you, how many people are noticing this? But it's there. I just don't think I'll ever cease to be amazed by the amount of detail in these places. Like, no one notices that. No one pays attention to the fact that there's a pirate mask that can only be seen in the neighboring land, essentially. But it's there to tell the story. It's amazing. The next detail is one of the most infamous and mysterious to point out. It's this crypt right here along the water side, kind of underneath the haunted mansion. There's a lot of lore and backstory as to what this crypt could possibly be doing here. A lot of people wonder what the date 1764 is a nod to. There hasn't been anything confirmed that I could find online, but a lot of the rumors speculate that that was just like a glory day of sailing the seven seas or of New Orleans. If you have a guess as to what the crypt is, let me know, but it's here. Okay, y'all, imagine my delight when I open up Genie Plus to come to Disneyland and I realize that it offers me Haunted Mansion Holiday. And I thought, is that a typo? Surely not. But yeah, Haunted Mansion Holiday is still happening right now, even though I'm here at the end of January. It's running through the end of this month. I'm catching it by like three more days, which means one, 
I get to ride it and it's literally the coolest thing ever. And two, I can share Haunted Mansion Holiday fun facts. Haunted Mansion Holiday is the complete overhaul of the Haunted Mansion that happens here every year in Disneyland for the Halloween and Christmas seasons. It is completely overtaken by the Nightmare Before Christmas characters, Jack, Sally, Zero, Oogie Boogie, and the rest of the gang. And no, you don't have to be a Nightmare Before Christmas fan to enjoy Haunted Mansion Holiday. Anyone can enjoy it and just be boggled by its amazingness. And no, I still haven't seen Nightmare Before Christmas. A couple of fun facts about Haunted Mansion Holiday specifically. In the graveyard scene, that final main scene of the attraction, they have to bring in 7,500 square feet of snow, 20 gallons of ultraviolet paint, and a thousand orange twinkly lights to bring that scene to life. Another thing I love about Haunted Mansion Holiday is that in the ballroom scene, they have the culinary team make a gingerbread house every year and it changes every year. They use hundreds of pounds of flour and eggs and sugar and butter to make a real gingerbread house. This year's is really cool. It has a working guillotine on it. So that's something to look for every time you're gonna wanna notice those details. And because of that gingerbread house, they actually waft the scent of gingerbread into the pre-show and loading area so that your senses start realizing that a sweet treat lays before you. Haunted Mansion Holiday is truly like nothing I've ever seen in a Disney park. They add in over two dozen new animatronics. They completely overhauled the story. They animated special clips for the stretch room and the pre-show. It is unbelievable. But maybe my favorite thing about Haunted Mansion Holiday is the fact that for Madame Leota, they needed Madame Leota, one of the most famous characters of the ballroom whose head is in the globe. She reads you your seance. They needed her to say different things. They needed to animate her saying something different than in the original attraction. So they needed a new face. Unfortunately, by the time they started doing Haunted Mansion Holiday, Imagineer Leota Tombs had already passed away. And with a name like Leota Tombs, it's no wonder she ended up in the Haunted Mansion. But they actually used her daughter, Kim Irving, who went into the family business and also became an Imagineer. She is the face that they use for Madame Leota during Haunted Mansion Holiday. And I think that is so cool couple of cool non-Haunted Mansion holiday exclusive things to look for at Haunted Mansion in Disneyland. Number one, the pipe organ that they use in the ballroom scene to play the music. That was actually the organ used on screen in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And number two, probably the most famous ghost, the most infamous ghost here at the Haunted Mansion in Disneyland is the Hatbox Ghost. He is absolutely incredible, but he didn't always work. Hatbox Ghost was an original concept that Yale Gracie, the master of special effects, thought up when they were designing Haunted Mansion. The idea was it was a ghost who had a hat box and his head would disappear and then reappear in the hat box. They worked out how to do it in the Imagineering offices. They thought this is brilliant. They didn't account for the ambient light that would creep into the attic, meaning you'd actually see the hat box ghost and the effect prior to when they wanted you to see it in the attic. It kind of lost its effect. The light made it so that it didn't look as good as it did when they were doing Imagineering. And because Imagineers are perfectionists, they decided to just pull it all together and they couldn't figure out how to fix it. This was in 1969 when the attraction first opened, and it wasn't until 2015 that the Hatbox Ghost made his return to Disneyland. We had new technology at this point. They were able to figure out how to make the effect work, and they installed the Hatbox Ghost into Haunted Mansion, and he is truly a work of art. And as a bonus, they're finally bringing Hatbox Ghost to the Magic Kingdom. They announced it at D23 last year. There's no set date, but he's truly amazing. And in my opinion, worth riding this one alone just to see him. And now I'm like 20 times happier that it's Haunted Mansion Holiday. Couple other things to look for in the mansion. One, when you go through the queue, you are gonna see that haunted hearse. That is actually a an Imagineer owned that for some reason. That's a real old fashioned hearse, so enjoy. Uh, additionally, one thing I think that's really interesting that's a difference between the Haunted Mansion in Magic Kingdom and the Haunted Mansion here is the stretch room, one of the most iconic scenes of the Haunted Mansion. They had a problem here that they needed to get you out and under the train station into the big show building backstage. Spoiler alert, the entire mansion doesn't take place in the plantation home that you can see. So the Imagineers need to figure out how to get you from here under the train station, which runs through New Orleans Square and into the building backstage. So they actually made it an elevator. So when you are in the stretch room here at Disneyland, you go into the stretch room, the portraits begin to stretch. That's because you are going down and under the train tracks. When they built it in Magic Kingdom, it was an opening day attraction. They didn't need to worry about having you go in an elevator. They had plenty of room. The train track cleared it. But they knew they had to build a stretch room because it's such an iconic part of the mansion. So they ended up actually making it stretch and having the ceiling rise in Magic Kingdom. So if you hear in Magic Kingdom, oh, it's an elevator. That's not true there, but it is true here. 
I went through a whole bunch of the backstory and history of the mansion in the Magic Kingdom version, so I don't want to repeat that as well. Um, but one thing I do love here is that they have a nod to one of the original ideas from the Haunted Mansion. And this hasn't been around for that long. They added it a few years ago. But in the area in between the stretch room and loading into your Doom Buggy, there's one, a portrait of a woman. It's called April to December, and she ages throughout the year. And she goes from a very beautiful young woman to quite an old woman in just a few short months. So I don't know, maybe her husband was annoying her. She's back. She was an idea from Mark Davis, who was the jokester who made all the gags that you see in attractions, and Yale Gracie, who is the master of special effects. They made April to December. She was in the portrait gallery, then she went missing. She's now back in the load area. But also near April to December is a statue of a cat, and you might notice that the one eye on the cat will blink red and turn off and on. That's actually an idea that Rolly Crump had. Rolly Crump was one of the Imagineers that worked on Haunted Mansion. And ultimately, there were three people that really had good ideas for the Haunted Mansion. There was Claude Coates, who wanted to be spooky, scary, something particularly dark and creepy. He was a background artist. There was Mark Davis, who I've already told you was a jokester. He was a prankster. He wanted the Haunted Mansion to be full of funny and silly sight gags. Eventually, those two basically designed the mansion. One half was Claude, one half was Mark's. But people don't often hear about Rolly Crump, who was an Imagineer who was a little eccentric. He is responsible for building things like the Tower of the Winds at the New York World's Fair, which was outside It's a Small World. And he wanted Haunted Mansion to be like a museum of the weird, with kind of oddities and uh, unusual, the macabre. And he thought that the narrator, the story character of the Haunted Mansion, should be a one-eyed cat, which they were like, that's odd but the one-eyed cat that you can see with the red blinking eye is a nod to Rolly Crump in that original idea. The other cool thing about the Madame Leona moment is that she is reciting what her loved one is going to bring her for Christmas, and it is a Haunted Mansion parody of the 12 Days of Christmas. So she's got like two poison potions, 10 tea leaves, um, and if you look around her, she's got playing cards, and they list out her items that she's getting for Christmas. Much less birds in her version than the classic. Simply obsessed. Also, there's over 400 candles and 100 jack-o'-lanterns on the outside of the mansion alone that decorate it for this event. Twas the nightmare before Christmas that rolled through the house. Not a creature was peaceful, not even. We'll continue your holiday tour momentarily. Keep my love. I just love Haunted Mansion Holiday. I think it is so unbelievably cool that they took an attraction that we all know and love and made it into a completely different attraction. This land is just wonderful. There's only one more thing we could do in this land that would make it a chef's kiss perfect moment in New Orleans Square. You probably already know where I went. Had to get Mickey beignets, obviously. These are the most delectable treat that is possibly on planet Earth. They're the Mickey beignets. They come in a three or a six pack. They also have seasonal flavored beignets, but I like the classics. Get them right here in Mint Julep Bar in New Orleans Square. Mm, they're so hot and fresh and doughy. And I'm standing in a powdered sugar graveyard because everyone gets it all over. And it's just the best. Plus, I'm standing right by the train station. I can hear the telegraph machine going at the, at the New Orleans Square train station stop. Bonus fun fact. The telegraph in Morse code is to all who come to this happy place welcome, which is Walt Disney's opening day speech. Mm, it's just the best. Made it to our next land, Critter Country. This is the home of Splash Mountain, which, spoiler alert, we're not riding. I've actually never ridden Splash Mountain here in Disneyland, and that will stay a true fact for the rest of my life. Though no, instead we're headed to meet everyone's favorite real estate mogul bear, Winnie the Pooh. 
The same way that Winnie the Pooh evacuated Mr. Toad from Magic Kingdom, he kicked out the country bears here in Disneyland to make way for the mini adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Now, the mini adventures of Winnie the Pooh is practically the same ride here in Disneyland as it is in the Magic Kingdom. However, instead of having nods to Mr. Toad, there are some nods to the country bears because Mr. the Pooh is nice that way. He's dancing on your grave, but at least he gives you a little credit as well. The main thing we're looking for, and I've actually never found it myself. I've never looked for it, so I'm excited. We're going on a little treasure hunt together. But the main thing is when you get into the honey room with Winnie the Pooh, if you turn around, you can actually see some of the characters from Country Bear Jamboree. Max, Buff, and Melvin, who are the taxidermied moose, elk, and buffalo, are still hanging on the wall. So let's go find them. Also, I've never thought about it. Does that mean Mr. Toad is not handing the deed to Owl in Owl's house? Let's look. <laughs> answer my own question, does Owl get the deed for Mr. Toad? No, he doesn't because this ride's completely different. I don't, I think I've ridden this ride one other time here, like 10 years ago. And I'm just always told by cast members it's the same as the one in Disney World, but it's definitely not. It's quite different. The plot line, some of the stories are similar, but like you don't bounce with Tigger. The ride vehicles are different. The scenes, the way they move are different here. I actually feel like it's more Disneyland here, which sounds weird, but it's like the quintessential dark ride that you'll see in Fantasyland with like the flaps that open as you go through things. That's part of the attraction here. The Heffalumps and Woozle scene is different. Pink Tigger is a vibe. The ending scene is different, so color me delighted and surprised. I also just think I like cannot get over the fact that those animatronics from Country Bears are just there. But a great attraction. I love Winnie the Pooh. They're some of my favorite stories. Tigger's one of my favorite characters. So I feel like this is a, a delightful attraction and it usually doesn't get too long to wait. But now there's a few other Country Bear things I'm looking for. While there may not be a portrait of Mr. Toad and Owl, if you come into Pooh Corner, which is the merchandise shop here that also has a treat area where you can buy Rice Krispie treats and stuff, if you look in the bakery area, you can actually see the Winnie the Pooh characters hanging out with the country bears. Like there's Gomer with Winnie the Pooh sitting on his piano. There's Winnie the Pooh and Teddy Bear. And if you look on the outside of Pooh Corner, you can see Mr. Sanders' house, which is where Winnie the Pooh lives. You've got the little tight with Eeyore's tail bows on it. And there's Kanga and Rue's mailbox. So, so cute. But another country bear nod. If you look over this way, you will see that there is a sign for Teddy Bear's Swingin' Arcade. Teddy Bear is the country bear, the lady country bear that lowers down on the swing and sings her little song. So a few subtle nods to the country bears as, you know, Winnie the Pooh did kick them out of their home. Max has more of a conspiracy on that, but... You know, it's nice they're remembered. Rootin' tootin' scootin' our way into Frontierland, where the first thing obviously we have to talk about is the petrified tree. Petrified, what am I, an Animal Kingdom in 1998? What a niche joke that was. Anyway, this petrified tree is believed to be between 50 to 70 million years old and 200 feet tall. And for some reason, it now lives in Disneyland. Now I've heard many versions of this story. I've actually gone on a research trail to learn more about this tree. Uh, and there's several versions of the story. There's the version that Walt saw it and gave it to Lillian. There's a version where the National Parks gave it to Lillian. Main thing is that it was a gift to Lillian Disney, Walt's wife, and then she put it in the park. Uh, my favorite version of the story is that she received the gift and she said to Walt, wouldn't this look nice in your park? And he was like, yes, dear. I think any married couple has had that conversation, so it just makes me laugh. Next up, we find ourselves in the courtyard of uh, Rancho del Zocalo, which is a quick service Tex-Mex spot here in Frontierland. And there's a window right here that says Mineral Hall. That is a nod to an exhibit and gift shop that was here in Disneyland called Mineral Hall for the 1950s and 60s. And that's not the only nod to old attractions here in Frontierland. We're headed to ride one of my favorite Disney classics and look for some others. Yee! 
Yeehaw. Friends, we are officially headed to the wildest ride in the wilderness, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. One of my favorites. Flip flops of space for my favorite of the Disney mountains, but boy, do I love this one here in Disneyland. Now, when this attraction opened, it was called Rainbow Caverns Mine Train, and it wasn't the root and toot and scootin' attraction that we know and love today. It was a much slower paced journey, but you did go through things like the old mining town of Rainbow Ridge, Dinosaur Bones, Cascade Peak, Waterfalls, etc. A few years later, they expanded the attraction to be called the Mine Train through Nature's Wonderland, and it closed in 1977 to make way for Big Thunder Mountain. Railroad. But a few features of the original attraction remain on. For starters, the mining town is still called Rainbow Ridge, and unfortunately, they're a little down on their luck. However, you can see nods to Rainbow Ridge and its population throughout the attraction. Additionally, set pieces like some of the dinosaur bones remained for Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, as well as the narrator, Dallas McKinnon, famous voice actor in the Disney community, known for movies such as 101 Dalmatians, Lady and the Tramp, Bed knobs and broomsticks. He did the original narration on the Rainbow Ridge as well as the mine train through nature's wonders. He also does the hang on to your hats and glasses because this here's the wildest ride in the wilderness at Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. Couple other things to look for at Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. One, there is a sign pointing you to every Big Thunder Mountain in the world. That's a good one to look for. Additionally, when you're going through the queue, you will see four horseshoes nailed to the wall the right side up. That is a superstition from the Wild West. The superstition was that the horseshoe would hold your good luck. So you would nail it up to the wall, people might touch it or kiss it, and it was a sign of good luck. But on the attraction, just before you go into the dangerous mine scene, look and see if you can see a horseshoe on the wall and see which direction it's facing. Additionally, as you are going through the town at the end, you are gonna see a prospector, a well-to-do man of Rainbow Ridge, and he may look a little familiar. It's Imagineer Tony Baxter, who is the main Imagineer at Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. So let's go. I love this ride, and it's better here not only because of Dynamite Goat, but mostly because of Dynamite Goat. I simply love Big Thunder Mountain so much. I think it's so fun, it makes me laugh every time. I don't care what coast you're on. Also, try and figure out before we give you the answer which Big Thunder each of these signs is pointing to. Because the name of it might give it away if you're a big Disney nerd or the distance. So, start the clock. How many did you get right? Last thing in Frontierland, this right here looks like just a set piece. It says abandoned mine keep out and it's got train tracks that go through. That is part of mine train through nature's wonderland. Obviously it's closed up, but kind of fun that's still here. Now off to the land of fantasy. Welcome to my favorite land in Disneyland, Fantasyland, where I have acquired a cold brew from Red Rose Tavern, which is a Beauty and the Beast themed restaurant. They do these fun different cold brews seasonally. This is called the Tavern Brew. It's like vanilla, cinnamon, and caramel and cold brew. It's a little sweet for me, but I've had sweeter and it's pretty delicious and it's on the order. But now we are gonna take the cold brew to one of my favorite things in Fantasyland. Actually, first we're gonna pause to find Jingles. Jingles is a horse that's very special, much like Cinderella's horse at the carousel in Walt Disney World, except for Jingles belongs to Julie Andrews. He was all decked out for her and it was a gift to Julie Andrews as a thank you for all of her hard work she's done for the Disney company. So it is the most prized horse 
on the carousel. It's the one with all the jingle bells, surprisingly. Okay, now we're headed to our next secret, and it's not the same kind of secret as the other stuff I'm showing you. It's not like a little Easter egg or detail or anything, but it's just something I feel like not a lot of people know exists in Disneyland, especially if you're Disney Worlders, who are used to the castle being occupied by Cinderella's royal table. You can't just go in the castle whenever you want. You have to have a dining reservation. Here in Disneyland, there's actually a walkthrough. It was an opening day walkthrough of Sleeping Beauty Castle and it's dioramas of the story of Sleeping Beauty. And I love it. It's one of my kind of like low key underrated favorite Disneyland things just because it's really quaint and sweet and it is the essence of Disneyland in my opinion. Plus it's a little scary. So we're gonna walk through this with my cold brew and it's just one of those don't miss, there's never a line. You just walk through at your own pace, moment to Disneyland. such a cute walkthrough. It's relaxing, it's pretty, the artwork is gorgeous, that's a beautiful movie. Also, just a like bonus fun fact about the castle, um, Disneyland opened in 1955, Sleeping Beauty didn't come out until 1959. Talk about the most extra marketing ploy of all time. They literally chose Sleeping Beauty to market a movie that wouldn't come out for four years. Bolt. Princess Aurora, AKA Sleeping Beauty, is not the only princess you'll find in Fantasyland. You've also got the famous Snow White Fountain right here to the right side of the castle if you're looking at it. It's got all seven dwarves, Snow White, and some of the woodland creatures, and it's here at the Wishing Well, which reads, your wishes will help children everywhere because Disney donates money from their wishing wells and fountains to make a wish. So if you donate something into the fountain, it will go to kids everywhere. Except for Animal Kingdom, actually it goes to the Disney Conservation Funds there. But if you stick around the wishing well long enough, you can actually hear Snow White's echo come from the fountain. And if you come visit the wishing well at night, it actually does a little song and dance where some of the fish and animals move around and sing a little song. That actually may happen during the day too, but I've only seen it at night and it's prettier at night. So I would recommend seeing it at night. Popping over to the Bibbidi Boppity Boutique. No, not for me to get a makeover. Um, you have to be 12 or under. But to show you a very adorable detail, when this shop opened, it was called Tinker Bell's Toy Shop. So they have some leftover friends from the Peter Pan layover. You've got Mr. Smee, Captain Hook, and the Tick Tock Croc. I just love these wooden carvings. They're so adorable to me. Also, I love these windows. They have them on Main Street as well, and they have more of them around here in Disneyland. They're just like these old school windows with these beautiful dioramas of different stories. They're just so cute and quaint, like everything in Disneyland. Gonna pop onto Pinocchio's Daring Journey next. Now, this is not an opening day at Disneyland attraction like many things in Fantasyland. This one didn't come until 1983. It also opened up in Tokyo that same year. Here in Disneyland, it replaced the Mickey Mouse Club Theater. Like many of the attractions here in Fantasyland, it is a dark ride that takes you through the tale of Pinocchio. Also, like many of the attractions in Fantasyland, it's an absolute waking nightmare. I don't know if any of you have watched Pinocchio recently, but it is scarier than The Shining. First of all, the whole premise of Pinocchio is these children are lured away by like candy and cigarettes by a scary man who wants to turn them into donkeys and then traffic them into manual unpaid labor as donkeys. To my knowledge, there's no cure to that. So you just, as a child, are lured by candy and then turned into a donkey to work in the salt mines forever. I can't think of anything scarier. And in Pinocchio's Daring Journey, that happens to you too. At one point, you are a child at Pleasure Island and you almost get trapped in the cave. You see children halfway between human and donkey. You hear them cry out, Mom, I want my mom. It's terrifying. Let's go ride it. One thing to look for if you, again, get past the horror show you're riding through is that in the pile of goods in Treasure Island, the Mona Lisa painting is among them. Yeah. 
guy is out of your cell. Mama! Mama! Don't, don't, don't hit me away, dude. I'm so happy. I'm just saying if being turned into a donkey doesn't scare you, Monster of the Whale will. But also, it is kind of fun that in the movie Pinocchio, the bad kid that Pinocchio befriends does draw on the Mona Lisa, so the Mona Lisa in the ride has a mustache on it. Oh, wow, that ride is something. I love it. And speaking of nightmares, we're now headed to Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, the family-friendly attraction where you jump in a car, get drunk, crash your car, and go to hell. That's quite literally the theme here at Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. And it's our Master of Chaos, Max's favorite attraction in Disneyland. On the real, I love this attraction too. It just, all of these attractions are so quintessentially Disneyland. I could spend all day in Fantasyland, but we are gonna head on Mr. Toad's Wild Ride to nowhere in particular. A couple things to point out though. We pointed them out before, but the weather vanes are really fun to look at in Disneyland. They're all different themed. You can see that one is Mr. Toad driving his car. If you look over at Peter Pan's flight, it's a pirate ship. So that's a fun detail to take a look for. Another thing to take a look at when you're on Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, when you are driving through the village, you will actually see Sherlock Holmes, his silhouette in the window of one of the businesses that you drive by. Now, Sherlock Holmes is not a Disney character, but it is a British story, as is the Wind in the Willows, which is what Mr. Toad's Wild Ride is based on. You also will see that they're going to a pub called the Green Dragon, which is the name of the pub in the Shire from Lord of the Rings. And I can't help but wonder if that's also an Easter egg, even though Wind in the Willows was written before The Hobbit and before Lord of the Rings, those were both written before the ride opened. So part of me wonders if they just were like making nods to other British literature. I like to believe that there's a world where Lord of the Rings and Mr. Toad's Wild Ride are connected, so I'm gonna have faith that's what's true. Anyway, let's go on a journey to nowhere in particular. be controversial but I'm a little chilly right now I could have stayed in hell a bit longer it felt nice in there on the rail that attraction is literally so wild you can't help but love it one more around the corner here at Peter Pan's flight and then we're headed to the Matterhorn another hidden Mickey for you if you look up in this window right here of the darlings nursery you'll see they've got a few toys including a Duffy bear the Disney Duffy from Tokyo Disney all Duffies have a Mickey Mouse on their paw pads so I guess technically it's a hidden Mickey maybe a hidden Duffy you decide. Ooh, you know, I've been walking around a lot. I feel like I could really use a, an adjustment. So you know what that means. We're riding the Matterhorn. First thing though, how cute is the Roasty Toasty for the Matterhorn? Roasty Toasties are this weird Disneyland thing that like these little dudes, dudettes, creatures, characters, and they make your popcorn for you at certain popcorn carts and they theme them to what land they're in. So like the Abominable Snowman makes the one here by the Matterhorn and Oogie Boogie is over at Haunted Mansion Holiday. And when it's not Haunted Mansion Holiday, it's a grave digger, like regular Haunted Mansion. There's a little puppet guy on Main Street. Duke Kaboom is over in Disney California Adventure. They're just like, cute and hilarious and I love them. There's like a sassy space lady in Tomorrowland. They're just like a Disneyland thing that I'm obsessed with. But we are about to go on the Matterhorn. This is a Disneyland staple. A lot of people hate it because it is rough. Like it is a rough ride, but I love it. So let's go. Well, let's learn fun facts and then we'll go. The Matterhorn opened up in 1969 as a way to bring more thrill to Disneyland. And Imagineer Bob Gurr quite literally had to teach himself trigonometry to be able to make this attraction work. Bob Gurr is one of my favorite Imagineers. He is the guy that basically if it was on wheels, Bob Gurr probably designed it. He designed things like the Autopia cars. He worked on the monorail. And then Walt Disney gave him the task of making a roller coaster, a steel coaster that had not yet been invented. Not only that, were they gonna have real people scaling the matter horn as part of the theming and the sky buckets were going to go right through it so talk about a challenge one of my favorite legends of the matterhorn something people love to talk about is the fact that there is a basketball court inside of it not a full basketball court but this is where the break room was for the cast members and they put up a basketball hoop so people would literally spend their breaks in the matterhorn playing basketball which is hilarious 
Also, I just noticed this weather vane right here. It's a little goat and he's adorable. And one important thing to look for while you are on the Matterhorn, at one point you are going to come across some hiking gear that has been abandoned, most likely because whoever had it was taken by the Yeti. One of the boxes amongst that gear says Wells Expedition, which is a nod to Frank Wells. He was the president of the Disney Company and an avid mountain climber, avid rock climber. That was his passion. And unfortunately, he died tragically in a plane accident. So this is a nod that Frank lives on forever in the Matterhorn, the mountain here in Disneyland. I'm so excited. I genuinely love the Matterhorn. I laugh so hard every time I ride this, like Big Thunder times a thousand. I just think it is so fun and so silly and you are whipping around and I think it's a blast. I especially love riding it at golden hour like this or at nighttime because the park looks beautiful. So yay, this is a Disneyland must do for me. As I said before, Matterhorn walked so Expedition Everest could run, okay? Pay tribute to the OGs. That's what Disneyland's all about. That ride is so ridiculous and so fun. I love it. it. I mean, and it was Golden Hours. Beautiful. A must ride for me when I'm in Disneyland. Okay, now on to another classic. It's a small world. There are few attractions as synonymous with Disney magic as It's a Small World. Making its debut at the 6465 World's Fair, it was a partnership between Disney and UNICEF. And it tells the message that I think is still so important and should resonate today. It's a small world after all. We're not so different, you and I. At the end of the day, there's just one moon, one golden sun. Smile means friendship to everyone. Mountains are wide and the oceans divide, but it's a small world after all. And I talked a lot about It's a Small World in volume two of the Secrets of Magic Kingdom video. I'm gonna try not to repeat anything, but I do wanna talk about a few things that are special here in Disneyland. First of all, here at Disneyland, it is an outdoor attraction. You've got this beautiful facade designed by Mary Blair and Rolly Crump. Remember Rolly Crump? We talked about him over at Haunted Mansion. He had this beautiful attention to detail, this kind of whimsical aesthetic. So he helped design the facade along with Mary Blair. Mary Blair was the lead Imagineer on It's a Small World. She was known for her concept art for classics such as Alice in Wonderland, Cinderella, and Peter Pan. An interesting thing about Mary Blair, she didn't actually have the best eyesight, which might be shocking considering she was an artist, but she had this amazing use of color. She didn't really use pastels or muted colors. She used bright and bold colors and color combinations that weren't very popular at the time. So maybe her less than stellar eyesight attributed to why she used such bright and fun colors. And there's actually a nod to Mary Blair in the Disneyland It's a Small World. In the France section up on the Eiffel Tower, there's a doll that is designed to look like Mary Blair, which is like, I'm gonna start crying just thinking about it. Another thing to look for, just like in Walt Disney World, there is a golden sun in every single room and it's designed a little bit differently to match the vibe and the aesthetic of whatever room it's in. I love that. I love that this ride is just like a big scavenger hunt. Also, this isn't really a secret, but maybe something if you're not a Disneylander will be surprising to you. There's Disney characters inside It's a Small World. I absolutely love this. And this was a big deal when they added them. People were furious that they were changing Walt's original It's a Small World. But Walt Disney himself said, keep moving forward and there must always be progress. So they decided to add dolls into the countries they live in, in the Small World style. So in the UK, you'll see Alice and you'll see Peter Pan. Over under the sea, you're gonna see Ariel. In China, you're gonna see Mulan and Mushu in Hawaii you're going to see Lilo and Stitch and I think it's so fun it's a really fun thing for kids too to kind of like go on a scavenger hunt to find as many Disney characters as you can and it's a small world it's just quintessential Disney magic so let's go board the happiest cruise that ever sailed a cute thing too about it's a small world is that every 15 minutes out of the iconic clock comes a processional of little dolls from all around the world and they do a little march around it's really really cute and just like another fun little moment you can have at it's a small world I'm 
obsessed with Disneyland Small World. I think it is so cute. I know it's basically the same as Walt Disney World, but there's something so special about being here and being on the original that Mary Blair, Bully Crump worked on, and Walt Disney himself rode that one. And that's just what is so special to me about Disneyland. Also, I think it's because the last few times I've been here, I've ridden the Christmas version of Small World. I've never noticed the Simba, Timon, and Pumbaa addition to Africa. I'm sure they've been there a long time. It's just with all the Christmas decorations, I never saw them. So that was great. Also a little side funny. Normally Disneyland's hippos, eyes both open and close. And it's the one thing I like more in Disney World because I like drunk hippo. But today, both hippos eyes were like, and I was like, oh, Disneyland was like, you got hippo with one working eye, we'll raise you none. I love it. It's probably not on purpose, but I like to think it is. Just past the It's a Small World exit is the entrance to Mickey's Toontown Fair, and we will be going there in a little bit. Mickey's Toontown Fair is largely still under refurbishment. They're completely reimagining the entire space, but they did just open up Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway here in Disneyland. Now, while the ride itself is the same as the one in Disney's Hollywood Studios and Walt Disney World, the queue is completely different. The theming is completely different, and there's a ton of Easter eggs in the queue. So we've got a lightning lane for that in a little bit. So we'll be back to Toontown. But for now, it's time to head to the land of tomorrow. Actually, our first Tomorrowland detail isn't even technically in Tomorrowland, but it's on this beam across from the Matterhorn. You'll notice this wooden box right here. It's got a little fish carved on it. Is that fish familiar to anyone? If you thought it's flounder, no. You need to learn your fish better. But if you realized it's Nemo, you're correct. He's actually pointing the way to our next attraction, the Finding Nemo Submarine Voyage. Oh my gosh, first of all, look at how cool the Disneyland 100 monorail is. It's all shiny and iridescent and beautiful, and I'm obsessed with it. Anyway, Finding Nemo opened in 2007 and it was a retheme of the original attraction here, which was called Submarine Voyage Through Liquid Space. It's similar to the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea attraction that they had in Magic Kingdom. And some people really hate this ride because it's kind of claustrophobic. I've actually only been on this ride one time ever. So we're about to change that and go ride it again. There's also one more Easter egg in the queue I'm looking for spoke to some lovely cast members out front and they told me a few more things to look for actually on the attraction. Towards the end of the attraction, there's two crabs fighting over a pipe and those crabs are little animatronic figures from the original attraction. Also, at the end of the attraction, the captain is gonna say something like, they wouldn't believe us even if we saw sea serpents and mermaids. That is a nod to the fact that when this attraction opened, they actually had mermaids that would like kick around and they'd be just like flopping around in the lagoon flopping around I say that like they're like beautiful elegant mermaids and I'm like they're flopping around you get it though they had real mermaids and it was like one of the fun things about Disneyland is that you could see real mermaids from the monorail and from the sky buckets uh, swimming around near the submarine so that's a nod to the OG as well and here's what I was looking for in the queue you will see on the pipes it says TL59 that stands for Tomorrowland 1959 which is the year the original submarine voyage through liquid space opened okay here we go. This is snug. Ooh. Ooh. A starfish. As the conditions of our voyage may be unpredictable, please remain safe and take it down. take but I kind of loved it it is very claustrophobic so I understand why people that don't like small spaces do not like that it may help knowing that you're not actually going under the water like the top part of you is above the water the whole time they do use some of the technology they use in um, the seas at Epcot where they like project the fish into the water but there was something about the practical sets that they use that really made me feel like I was in the 50s like I feel like that would have been a wonder in the 50s and 60s so I liked it would I wait a long time for it no it's a pretty long attraction and there's obviously much more iconic things to do Disneyland, but if it doesn't have a long wait and you've never done it before and you're not claustrophobic, I liked it. 
Next up, I'm headed to Autopia, which is essentially Tomorrowland Speedway, but it is an opening day ride here in Disneyland. A couple things to look for. It is, you travel down Route 55, which is not to the fact that Disneyland opened in 1955. Also on a platform at one point, you may see a small car. That is from an attraction that used to be in Disneyland. It was called, and I quote, Midget Autopia. It was designed for smaller kids that weren't big enough to drive the Autopia cars, uh, but it closed in 1966 to make way for It's a Small World. But one of the cars presented on the attraction is from that ride. All right, let's drive. Here we go. Oh, wow. Just as good at driving these as the ones in Disney World, aren't we? I can buy myself flowers. Have my name in the sand. The bad news, the midget racing car wasn't there, but it looked like this. So it must have gone away when they redid the attraction. It's actually kind of fun. It's like travel of the future, but to make up for that loss, I did spot another Easter egg and that's that the license plates are all fun nods to different things. A couple I saw were WED, which is Walter Elias Disney, E-Ticket, dreams so that's kind of cute two more rides to point out some cool things here in tomorrowland first one we're headed to see my main man first of all how cute is the stroller parking sign it looks like one of the little pizza planet aliens adorable headed to buzz lightyear astro blasters this is disneyland's version of buzz lightyear space ranger spin it's a little bit different for starters you can actually pick the gun up which i find to be much more helpful when you're trying to shoot the aliens additionally the targets actually react when you shoot them which makes it easier to see what you're hitting also the targets are different shapes based on how many points they are worth which i find again easier than just having to guess and know the easter egg targets in the disney world version a very cute detail to look for is in the queue you will see one of the batteries and if you take a closer look you'll notice that it was made in glendale which is where walt disney imagineering is located it also says gamma quadrant because when buzz introduces himself to the toys that that's where he says he's from. It also says that on his box. Find his robots and his secret weapon and blast them. Ray Squadron will retrieve the power cells. While the rest of you concentrate on those robots. <laughs> You have saved our lives. We are eternally grateful. I am definitely better at the one in Disney World because I have more practice, but I did get level four, which isn't bad. Another Easter egg I noticed while playing the game is that at the end, the alien's catching a rocket in a net, and it's the big one, which is the rocket that Sid buys in the original Toy Story that he's gonna send Buzz to the moon with. Do you think I can fit in that Panda May shirt? Probably not, right? Also playing the game, I learned that the diamonds are worth the most. Another thing I noticed while I was on the ride is a couple of the robots actually make Goofy's noise. Uh, they're kind of in this darker section and if you can hit their targets, it lights them up and they go, Yahoo! which is like Goofy's famous yell. I'm not quite as good at this buzz as I am at the one in Disney World, but I still think those rides are so fun and have so much rewritability. Okay, the next one we're talking about is right across the way and it's Star Tours. Did you know that's located here in Disneyland Park? Definitely weird for us Disney Worlders to think that Star Tours is in the Magic Kingdom equivalent, but yes, it sits here in Tomorrowland. There's also Galaxy's Edge here, which is completely different and in a whole other part of the park. 
which makes not a ton of sense. But, you know, what are you going to do? Also, I didn't go in there because all the Easter eggs are the same as they are in Disney World. Now, this is the exact same attraction as in Hollywood Studios. It's Star Tours, the Adventures Continue TM, where you could get a whole array of different experiences based on which version of the ride. There's different beginnings, middles, and ends, so you may end up on different planets, facing off against different baddies, talking to different heroes. But a couple cool things to look for in Star Tours, particularly in the queue. First up, the C-3PO and R2-D2 you see in the queue were actually used on screen in the Star Wars saga. So Star Wars nerds, get excited for that. Also, take a look at the security scanning droid. First of all, he's voiced by Patrick Warburton. But if you watch him for a little bit, you may notice that he scans some unusual items, such as Chip and Dale. And last but not least, there's a couple of droids that if you take a look at their feet, you'll notice they're webbed. Well, those goose droids were actually reimagined animatronics that were originally used on the America Sings attraction, which was over in Critter Country. It was what Splash Mountain took over. Oftentimes, Disney will reskin their animatronics and use them other places, but they can't get rid of the fact that these were originally geese and have webbed feet. So now the droids actually have webbed feet. Star Tours makes me incredibly nauseous, so I didn't ride. I just went on a little cute scavenger hunt, but there's some fun things in that one. At this point, I'm just waiting for my far off lightning lane for Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, so I think it's time to feed again. Disney Animation Studios has invited audiences to believe in things never thought possible. And so tonight, we once again invite you to wish upon stars, to step into the unknown, and to join us on this, our wondrous journey. <laughs> I went across to DCA to get cheese on a stick. And I came back to see the fireworks, which we've already talked about in the D100 video, but in real time, tonight's the first time I'm seeing them. It's the first time that they existed. What a show. What a show. That may be the best fireworks show I've ever seen. Except for maybe Wishes, but that's just because I have nostalgia for Wishes. Wow, beautiful. The animation is gorgeous. And the fireworks, they're only on the weekends right now. Otherwise, you can see the projections. It's worth it, I think, just to see the projections because they are crisp, they are clean, they are a storytelling masterclass. I'm gonna cry again just thinking about it. We gotta ride Mickey and Minnie's. Mickey's Toontown. I think I called it Mickey's Toontown Fair earlier. That's what it was called in Disney World. But Mickey's Toontown still exists here in Disneyland. However, it's closed right now for a gigantic refurbishment. It's still gonna have Roger Rabbit's cartoon spin, but it's gonna be completely redone and reimagined and beautiful. But what has opened, actually officially today, the day I'm filming this, is Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. It is the same ride as it is in Hollywood Studios. However, the theming is completely different. It takes place in the El Capitoon Theater. Get it? Like the El Capitan, the famous theater in Hollywood, but it's the El Capitoon Theater. And there's tons of Easter eggs. I'm so excited to go look for a bunch of them in the queue. Now, if you are coming to Disneyland and you want to ride Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, it is a virtual queue or a fancy ride lightning lane. There's no standby line. Virtual queue is available at 7 a.m. Have to have a Disneyland park reservation or one 1 p.m. have to be in the park, uh, just like a boarding group for Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind in Walt Disney World. You can start pre-selecting your party up to an hour before those drops. Make sure you do it. Best advice I have for you, use a world clock. Be ready to hit refresh right on the dot. That's 659.59. Hit that refresh and hopefully you'll get a spot. Now, as a reminder, Genie Plus works a little bit differently in Disneyland as well. Fancy rides and lightning lanes for any kind of Genie Plus cannot be booked until you're in the park. So if you want to ride this attraction, you need to get in the park and be able to buy your fancy ride. The Easter eggs are already starting because we've got a modern mousterpiece. Don't you love it? 
And if you look at just the red letters, it's a must see. These aren't making a mini's Easter eggs, but these are making me smile because this is Toontown. You can kind of get into a few little pieces of it right now, but just like on Main Street USA where important people have windows, they have the same thing except for it's for tunes. Like the BB Wolf, he's retired from the Huffin and Puffin Wrecking Company. Then you've got the three little pigs as the proprietors of the Chin 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 Construction Company. And right here you've got Jiminy Cricket, a motivational speaker, no foolin' ink. Adorable. Starting strong here with the El Capi Toon Theater. Toontown's original movie house has been delighting audiences since the dawn of the moving picture. Just don't sit in row J seat five. It squeaks. <laughs> the ticket booth is also chock full of Easter eggs. You'll see that the person supposed to be there is on a break because they're catching a movie. Fans of a goofy movie will notice that their mug is a souvenir from Lester's Possum Park. That might be my favorite part. If you look at the sticky notes on the wall, you'll see that Scrooge is demanding refunds and Huey was here and Dewey and Louie. But probably the most clever of the Easter eggs, particularly in the ticket booth, is the fact that there's one that says call Tilly. Now this is a nod to Main Street USA. There is the Main Street Cinema, which still plays clips from classic Disney cartoons such as Steamboat Willie. And if you look at the admission ticket taker there, you'll notice it's a nice woman named Tilly from Marceline, Missouri. Um, okay, I'm already obsessed with all of these fake movie posters starring Mickey and the gang, like Minnie Mouse in Mickey, I Shrunk the Nieces, and Goofy Friday, like Freaky Friday, but it's Goofy and Max. Oh my god, it's getting better somehow. You've got the absent-minded Professor Von Drake. We need more Ludic Von Drake representation. Also high school, go-fishal, goofishal. High school, goofical. That's it, musical, but goofical, senior year. And it's Max Goof and all his pals from a Goofy movie. And then the feisty ducks, like the mighty ducks. Oh my God, I'm gonna scream. Miska Muska, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And the Scrooge, Scroogeous Millionaire, this is the best thing ever. We just got in this queue and I'm already like, this is the greatest queue ever. The Mouseketeer, like the Rocketeer and the Chipmunk Trap. Oh my, my heart. Now we are entering a, an homage to Mickey. It was all started by a mouse, so this is like Mickey through the years. Look, and here is the history of the El Capi tune. And <laughs> this is a, a, one of the skeletons from Skeleton Dance's arms. Fred R. Femur, skeleton number three. Oh, flowers and trees. Oh my God. Up the original pair of 3D glasses, the first ever hot dog. Do not eat. Listen, not to tell me twice. Hot, oh, the ribbon, the scissors on loan from Willie the Giant. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's the Steamboat Willie. It's the helm. And it says, it's the actual prop. It's the wheel deal. Can I touch it? <gasps> I could steer the ship. <gasps> It's the plane from Plane Crazy. The music from the band concert, as well as the drum. And then here's Fantasia. Of course, this is Mickey's like biggest role. And I was told that I should stand here for a second. So I will. Brave little Taylor and Lonesome Ghosts. It's all of Mickey's best roles. Oh my gosh. Mickey's birthday party costume, specifically designed for Mickey to cut a rug while looking fashionably hip. Well, yes. Mickey's birthday party cake. This is a prop cake, not real. Trust us, we tried it. And it's from Mickey's birthday party. There's more posters on the wall. This is from Fun and Francy Free. This is the beanstalk and you can hear it. Oh my gosh, it's like going through the ceiling. Hilarious. Pluto's Christmas tree props. Mickey says it was supposed to star Pluto, but a couple of tiny co-stars stole the show and some treats. I bet y'all know who it is. The Mickey Mouse disco and mouser size set is definitely my favorite. Also, I find this just so funny that they essentially built this. Oh, this is the prop desk from A Christmas Carol. See, I'm finding this so funny because it's like going through the old great movie ride queue where you saw props from actual movies except for they had to make all these props, obviously, because there wasn't a actual desk or actual costumes from Mickey's shorts because they were cartoons. 
So it's like this weird meta thing where like now we're looking at the Prince and the Pauper costumes and it's like they had to make these, but then they're putting them on display like they're artifacts of cinema. It is very clever. The concession stand is for sure the thing I'm most excited about. Look at all this candy. You've got witch hazelnut candy, wickedly good with that cranky witch. This is amazing. Power limes and it's power line on it. Hilarious. Cotton candy and it's literally colorful cotton. The cash registers have Mickey and Minnie's birthday on them. November 18th, 1928. That's when Steamboat Willie premiered and thus is Mickey and Minnie's birthday. But perhaps the best detail is that they have a roasty toasty right here in Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. And if you look at the popcorn, it's actually hidden Mickey's and Minnie's. Take a close look. Minnie has a bow on, Mickey doesn't. It's amazing. Oh my gosh, more amazing candy. You've got McDuck's chocolate coins with Scrooge on them. Laughograms, you'll want s'more. That's an onto Laughogram Comics, which was Walt Disney's uh, cartoon studio in Kansas City prior to moving. You've got gummy bears, not you know gummy bears, and mallard cups like Darkwing Duck. Oh my gosh, and Grasshopper and the Ants from Silly Symphonies. This is amazing. Take it one step further. Schwartz is one of the Imagineers that worked on this attraction. The condiment bar is also amazing. You've got ketchup and catsup. It's Figaro's finest. Figaro the cat, of course. Your cheese and nacho cheese. Butter in parentheses. Ain't that the truth when you go to the movies. Also yellow mustard and fancy Dijon mustard. Also, remember when I told you about the little man who lived at Disneyland? His name is Patrick Bagora. Well, look at this. Bagora Orchards. Hilarious. Also, it's all established in 1955. Smoke Tree, like Smoke Tree Ranch. Walt Disney actually had a tie on it that says STR in the partner statue because that was a ranch he liked to visit. Also, I love that they made mayonnaise secret sauce because ain't that the truth. I won't eat mayonnaise, but I will. You get a secret sauce or an aioli. And then you've got relish haggis, lovely, and uh, hot sauce. I know it's tempting to do the lightning lane for this attraction, and if you don't get a virtual queue, you may have to, but the lightning lane cuts off most of this, and as a Disney nerd, this is worth waiting for. Just make sure we're away from the railing in front of you and away from those doors behind you. They will be closing automatically. It's cute on both coasts. It is a little different. It's definitely not an exact duplicate of the attraction in Hollywood Studios. A couple of things I noticed that were different. Uh, the carnival tornado scene's a little more dramatic. Goofy has like an extra little bit where you drive through a tunnel. There's a few other small things. I also noticed a few Easter eggs that I don't think exist in the Florida version. One is there's a shop called Kevin's Ahaha Aloha Shirts. That's an odd to Kevin Rafferty, who was one of the lead Imagineers on this project. Also, uh, at one point you drive through kind of the like bad part of town on the way to the factory. There's a shop called the Brave Little Tailor Shop, which is an odd to the cartoon Brave Little Tailor with Mickey Mouse. Fun fact, uh, one of the only times Mickey doesn't have a tail is in Brave Little Tailor. Also, one thing I love is just like in Florida, the way that their costumes change, the cast members' costumes change from when you're going into the theater to when you're in the cartoon world. The same thing happens here too, but they're completely different costumes because they match the theme of being in Toontown. Really, really neat. What a really cute ride. What a cute ride, and honestly, that standby queue is so good. It makes me want to say that this version's better when the ride's basically the same, but this queue's great. Well, friends, that is a wrap on a pretty perfect day here in Disneyland. I had so much fun exploring Walt's original park, looking for those Easter eggs details, riding some of my favorite attractions, getting some of my favorite snacks, and I hope you had fun following along and maybe learned something new about Disneyland on the way. 
Let us know what other videos you want to see. We've got more Disneyland content coming your way. In the meantime, friends, make sure to rate, review, subscribe, follow us on social. And until next time, I'm Molly. And it's been so magical. Should I get a grilled cheese from Jolly Holiday to eat in my hotel room at midnight right now?